out of the body, I cannot tell. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven and saw things that are unspeakable. So he didn't know if he was in the body or not, but I know the answer. If you know the event that Paul was speaking about, Paul had just been stoned to death outside of Jerusalem. They had literally taken stones and thrown them at him until he expired. Laying there dead in a puddle of blood and in his uh, the stones that were thrown at him, the disciples looked at him and realized that he had died. In that period of time, God said that he took his spirit and his soul to heaven. And Paul says, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. But I'll de- I guarantee you the disciples looking at the body under that pile of rocks knew that his body was there. It was his soul and his spirit that went to heaven. Exactly with us. When we die in Jesus Christ, our body goes to the grave. And we have graveside services because that's where the body is committed. But at death, our spirit and our soul leave the body. And they go to be with the Lord up in heaven. Just as Paul. And so every Christian. I just wanted to review and clarify this information. Was anybody thinking that there are three different places Christians go when they die? There, there are three places. When I said there are three heavens, I don't mean kind of good Christians go to one heaven and a little bit better Christians go to the second one and really good Christians go to the third one. You'd have to study from Jehovah's Witnesses to get that. Okay? We, we are an uh, independent Bible believing Baptist church. Okay? Jehovah Witnesses teach that, but we don't. And I just want to make sure that you understood there's not three different places you go when you die and go Christ the Savior. There's only one. It's up. And your body doesn't go there. It's your soul and your spirit that go there. Every Christian who dies goes to heaven. The heaven of all reference is 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We live in the first heaven right now. Pinch yourself. If you say ouch, that means you're in the sky area, okay? You're on the earth. That's the first heaven. We have astronauts that have traveled to the second heaven. I would suggest you do that without a spacesuit. And Christians go to the third heaven when they die. Hopefully this clears up any misunderstanding from last week about the three heavens. All right. Now, y'all speak with me. All right. Let's move to the third truth of ten regarding the end times. Today's sermon, a disturbing place, a place called in the Bible, hell. Like the word heaven, hell is used in a generic sense throughout the Bible to speak of the various areas within the underworld that is under the earth's crust. Many of you asked for a copy of that diagram that I had on the overhead last week. And if you wanted that and didn't get it, just text me and I can text it right to you so that you can have it. What I did is I took a a smaller picture of that today to illustrate this issue of hell. And so you'll recognize the next slide as it comes up. Because it is a, a, it's, it's a closer view of that bigger diagram we had last week. When the Bible speaks of hell, sometimes it uses, uh, it's used to do, donate, uh, uh, to do, excuse me, the grave. Just simply means the grave. Sometimes it refers to the place where the soul and spirit of the dead go. And that's a specific area as well. Sometimes... We often refer to that as the place of torment. Sometimes it refers to the prison house of fallen angels. Jude spoke about that, the angels that lost their first estate. And in Genesis chapter 6, where angels cohabitated with human beings, and they produced giants. And so uh, sometimes it refers to the prison for those fallen angels. Who the psalmist said, they were born as angels, but they die as men. And so sometimes the context 
uh, uh, will speak of one of these three. And we always know the difference between these three because of the context of some of the newer versions that have been uh, published of Greece uh, of late. I try to use a different word. The problem is, is that the word doesn't always fit their uh, doctrinal beliefs, and so they just change the word wherever they want to. I prefer to use what God did, the generic word hell, because all of the places of hell have similar characteristics, and that is torment. And I believe God wanted us to look at it from that standpoint. Our focus this morning will follow the same pattern as last week, and I hope that you will have a better understanding of this place called hell as a result of the message today. Here are some questions that I'd like for us to answer about hell. First of all, where is hell? Well, right now, hell is under the crust of the earth, perhaps at its center. Give me the next one, Andy, if you would. Here is a blow-up of that slide that we had last week, and I tried to take the underworld, an arrow, to go down to this location of hell somewhere in the center of the earth. The Apostle Paul mentions this place in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, when he speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he says about him. Now that he ascended, that is Jesus, give me the next one, Andy, if you will, there you go. Now that he ascended, that is now that he Ascended. What is it that's ascended is up, right? All right. What is it but that he also descended second? No, first into the lower parts of the earth. <clears throat> this is a very interesting statement. Peter refers to this place in his first letter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 20, and again in chapter 4, verse 6. Where he says, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. That's an interesting concept. Preached the gospel to those that were dead. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh. But live according to God in the spirit. How the gospel was preached to those that were dead. So when Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross... They buried his body in a tomb, but his spirit and his soul went to paradise. See the chart again? See the cross? I brought the arrow down to the circle, or egg shape, whatever it is, there on uh, uh, paradise, which is also referred to as Abraham's bosom. These places, paradise and Abraham's bosom, one and the same, are the place of the law-abiding dead. And when Jesus died on the cross, before he ascended to heaven, he descended to the center of the earth and he preached to them according to the Bible. Then he went to hell and suffered the penalty that belongs to you and me. And on the third day, he did what no one else could do. He arose from the dead and ascended on God. Jesus when he died. For three days and three nights was buried, and this is the location of where he went first. As we learned last week, Abraham's bosom no longer has occupants. The reason for that is when Jesus came down there and he preached to those in paradise, the righteous dead, he preached to them, in essence, what we all know. These people in the Old Testament did not know about a Jesus. Christ. They knew about a prophet like an emotion, but they didn't know about Jesus Christ. They didn't know that when he came to this world that he would be crucified and that his death would secure eternal life. They didn't know that. All those that died from Adam on, none of them knew that. But many of them knew many other things. The descendants right after Adam and Eve knew that in order to be clothed, a lamb had to be sacrificed to clothe them. Of those that were in Egypt, those Jewish people in Egypt, realized that before they could be delivered from uh, the bondage of Egypt, uh, a picture of the world and of sin, that a lamb would have to be uh, uh, sacrificed, and the blood would have to be put on the lintel on the top of the doorpost and on the side of the doorpost. 
I don't know if in your mind you've ever connected them, but if you draw a line from the center of the lintel across to the side of the doorpost, you have a perfect picture of the cross. Those people in the Old Testament knew about the story of Abraham taking his son, his only son, up the Mount Moriah and raising up a, a knife to take his own son. And they remember what Isaac said just as they were getting ready to walk up that mountain, where he said to his father, we have the fire. We have the fire. But, but where is the lamb? And Abraham made that prophetic statement. God will provide himself a lamb. All of those from Adam up to those before Jesus was born, all of them knew these symbolisms, these pictures in the Old Testament. None of them knew Jesus. They never met Jesus Christ. They only met him in picture and in type. And when they died, secure in their belief that God had protected them, they went to Abraham's bosom of paradise. When Jesus died on the cross, he went to paradise, and he said, I am Isaac's lamb. I am the lamb that was shed for the clothing of Adam and Eve. I am the lamb that was shed and put on the doorpost as he came out of Egypt. I am the one that Moses said God would raise the prophet like unto Moses who would deliver his people. I'm the one. And then he said to them, I'm the water of life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the man of all the symbolisms of the Old Testament. And those in paradise, the righteous dead, trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the Bible said that when Jesus rose, he led captivity captive. He emptied Abraham's bosom. He emptied paradise out. And they went up, as Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, up to heaven with Jesus. Therefore, a paradise, as you see circled up there, is empty. It no longer has occupants. And yet the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14, sorry, Andrew, I know it's hard to follow me today. I'm mad at you so much. It's tough. It says, hell hath enlarged herself. And if you just think of the sheer mathematics of people who are dying without faith in Jesus Christ, those who died in rebellion against what they knew about God from Adam to Jesus, and those that have died without uh, a Christ as their Savior from Christ to the present time, where do all those people go? Just think of the mathematics of how many there must be that die without hope and without God. And therefore Isaiah prophetically speaks that hell has had to enlarge itself because there's so many unbelievers who die without Christ. At the end time, what we're studying, hell will become a lake of fire somewhere in space. A lake of fire. According to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13, our present earth is going to be destroyed. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, Peter wrote, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's climate warming. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. That's what's ahead. When God brings an end to this, what we know today, he is going to destroy the heavens, and the earth with fervent heat. John refers to this destruction as he writes in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 9, this, and they went, went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. If you follow the progression that John writes about there in John chapter 20, notice the culmination that he speaks of in verse 7 is the millennium and the destruction as a result of the assault of this world as they turn on Jerusalem and God's people in verse number 8. After the destruction of the heaven and the earth by fire, according to verse 9, notice what appears in verse 11. 
And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face, notice, the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Understand at the end of time, when God destroys this heaven and earth, and he begins to judge the world in righteousness, he is going to judge them suspended in space. No heaven, no earth, nothing. And he'll judge everyone. And after the judging of this suspended in space, verse 10, we are told that the devil is cast into this lake of fire. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. In verse 14, we are told that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. When we looked at the chart, remember that you have those that died in the grave and you have those that are in hell. They are going to both give up their occupants. And in verse 14, it says this. Thank you, Andrew. Go back if you would to slide verse 14. And death and hell were cast into this final hell called the lake of fire. Where is hell? Well, right now, hell is in the center of the earth. Well, one day, even the center of this earth's hell are going to vomit its inhabitants up to be judged in space by one who sits on the throne. Think of this. Paul, in writing to the Romans, says that God is going to give every lost person an opportunity to resist the judgment of God. They are going to argue against God. And after that, the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And Matthew wrote that they will bind them hand and foot and cast them into outer darkness. Hell at one time, at the end, will be nothing more than a lake of fire in space. What is hell? Well, perhaps the best place to gather an overall picture of hell is found in Luke 16. We looked there briefly last week. What is hell? Well, in Luke chapter 16, we're told, first of all, that it's a place of consciousness. Look here, in Luke 16, verse 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus, this place of consciousness. This isn't a place where it's just, you know, you're annihilated and you don't feel something. But there's consciousness in hell. That's not all. It's a place of torments. Look at verse 23. He said, in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. Four times the Holy Spirit uses the word torment in this account in Luke. There are only two torments specifically mentioned here in Luke. But others are spoken of throughout the Bible. Just to give you a close view, first of all, the thirst of hell is real. This is the first request that the rich man in hell had. Notice what he said. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. The thirst of hell is real. No doubt many times before he'd enjoyed fresh cold water from the well, but now he cries, his tongue swollen, his mouth dry. Water, water, I thirst. Not only that, I don't know if you've ever been thirsty. I mean, real thirsty. I don't want to make you thirsty this morning. But people do crazy things when they get thirsty. You've read about it. I don't mean to be improper here, but they drink their urine. They don't even drink salt water, even though if they know that it's poison, they know that it's going to hurt them. Their thirst is so obsession, so obsessive, that they must
must try to quench it. When we speak about the torments of hell, we speak about the thirst of hell. None of that. Let's keep it right here, Andrew, if you would. The fire of hell is real. In the last part of verse 24, he says, I am tormented in this flame. I am tormented in this flame. We've had several tragedies over the year involving fire, nightclubs, nursing homes, personal residence. Just recently, you probably have heard the news in uh, right over west of us. I think it's in Montezuma. Uh, a lady had a gas leak. And her house exploded. Maybe you hear about these things all the time. Terrible, haunting thoughts exist in people's mind about being burnt to death. When I was in the military, I lived in base housing for just a short time. Um, they were made, the back of the houses, their patios all faced one another in kind of a courtyard. One morning, I was getting ready to go to work. And, I mean, you could feel the explosion before you could hear it. And then you saw it happen in that order. And I looked out the back sliding glass window. And when I did, all I saw was smoke and debris and fire. And the story was it was a, one of the houses that was backyard shared with our back courtyard. The hot water tank. The pilot went out, and the lady didn't know it. And she went to light her cigarette in the morning when she woke up, and that's when the explosion took place. Three children in that apartment, and all three of them were destroyed by the fire that followed the explosion. Fire. The fire tells real. In every case, it is evident that people will do about anything they can do to get away from the heat and the torment that exists because of the flames, the heat, and the pain. In fact, in Revelation chapter number 14, verse 11, it says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. When we think of torments, we think of the thirst of hell, we think of the fire of hell. We also think of the gnashing of teeth in hell. In Matthew chapter 13, in verse number 42, it says, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's the gnashing of teeth like a wild man. The crying of one who is insane from the pain. If you listen for it, reading Luke 16, you can hear the gnashing of the teeth of the rich man. Gnashing teeth. I read a story years ago about a, during World War II, a B-52 bomber was returning from a bombing mission. During the flight, landing gear wouldn't come down; it had been shot up so bad. So they called the distress signal: "Mayday! Mayday! Mayday!" The runway was foam, but they overshot the foam. After hitting on the runway by itself without any fire retardant. It plane burst into flames instantly, killing all the aft crew. It slid until it finally ran into the tower, pinning the pilot in the cockpit. Those in the tower, as well as those emergency crews that were sent out to put out the fire of that plane, <clears throat> said you could hear the pilot a long way off screaming and gritting his teeth, his teeth, cut off my legs, cut off my legs, cut off my legs, oh no, cut off. According to the account of Luke 16, hell is a place of unfulfilled requests. It was the rich man who cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip his, dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Three requests, have mercy on me, send Lazarus, cool my tongue. None of them were fulfilled. None. Hell is a place of unfulfilled requests. I wonder how many people in hell are yelling at their family members. Someone will go tell them 
lest they come to a place like this. Unfulfilled request. It's also a place of remembrance. In verse 25 of Luke 16, Abraham said to the rich man, Son, remember, remember, remember that thou in my lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise thou receivest thy good things. An application. It's a place of remembrance. This fanciful idea that when you go to hell, you just don't exist, you have no consciousness, you have no memory, you have no, no feeling of pain, must have come out of the Bible, because it sure isn't in it. Everything that's in the Bible backs up everything I'm saying. It's a place of unfulfilled requests. It's a place of remembrance. It's a place of restraint. Wanting to do something and not being able to do it. Verse 26 says, Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fix so that they which would, there's a desire there, pass from thence to you, cannot. There's the restraint. Neither. There's the constraint again. Can they pass to us that would? There's the desire. Come from thence. It's a place of restraint. You cannot do what you want. I remember growing up as a kid, you know, we mocked everything. I was unsaved, so I mocked spiritual things. And I had this idea, yeah, when I go to hell, I'm going to stop, start a little quick store on the corner down in hell, and I'll sell ice cubes cheaper or something. Make some stupid statement like that. But not in hell. It's a place of restraint. You cannot do what you do. But it's also a place of regret. I look at verse 27 and 28 of Luke 16, where this man said, please, please, I have five brethren. Please, have them testify. Someone testify to them lest they come to this place. Don't let them come here. Please don't let them come here. Someone please come. When we speak about hell and what it is, perhaps one of the most painful considerations of hell would be that it is a place that has no end. No end. I've done a lot of jail work. I've visited with people online in prison. I've visited them in prison. And just like in the movies, then in the movies you've seen them, they have this little X, kind of like they make a calendar on the wall. All of them do that. And they're counting the years, or the months, or the days, until they get out. But there are no calendars in hell. There's no end. It never, ever ends. We've looked at so many verses up to this point, forever and ever. It repeatedly says, forever and ever. Perhaps one of the most painful considerations of hell is it is a place that has no end. Even on death row, there is hope. But in hell, there is no No end. This brings me to my third point today, the third question. Who goes to hell? Who goes to hell? And as we mentioned last week, Revelation 20, verse 15, so very pointedly, tells us the answer. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into a lake of fire. John, writing the book of Revelation in chapter 21, verse 8, specifically says, unbelievers go to hell. You know, I think it's so interesting and sad that the Bible is so clear even though God spoke more of hell than he did of heaven. He spoke of hell in the sense that he never created it for you and for me. The Bible says that it was created for the devil and his angels. <coughs> but unbelievers received the same sentence. <coughs> the Bible says over 2,000 years ago, because of his great love for you and for me. Knowing that we are without help, without hope, and without God, 
God wrapped himself in human flesh in the incarnation and came to this earth. Lived on this earth for three and a half years. <clears throat> to the rich man, I would say, what greater testifier would there be than Jesus? <clears throat> but they rejected Jesus. They would reject anyone that came back from the grave as well. And so they did with Jesus what they do with all three. They rejected him. <clears throat> they captured him. They tortured him. They mocked him. They crowned him in mockery with the crown of thorns. After torturing him, the Bible says in Psalms you couldn't tell the face of who it was. He had lost his visible identity because they beat him so bad. They further mock him. They put this righteous, good man on a cross and stuck him between two thieves to mock him. And there for the world to watch along with his mother, Mary, <clears throat> Jesus writhing in pain until finally he gave up the ghost. The Bible says he died. And on that moment, when even the sun had to bow its head, the Bible says it became dark over the whole earth. Star silence themselves. And the angels gasp. Jesus went down to the center of this earth and paid the price for every one of us so that we would not have to go to that whole carnival. Three days later, under lock and key at the tomb. The little stone rolled away and Jesus came victoriously from the grave. And he said, I died, I was buried, and I rose again. And to Paul, he said, you can wrap that up in a nice package, just like I got this morning from Rita and the church family, and call it the gospel. Paul said it, the death, the burial, and the resurrection is the good news that though we were condemned in sin and our unbelief would put us in a place called hell, that Jesus Christ had made a way to liberate us from the pain and the suffering and the penalty of hell. And he had delivered captivity captive and he had gone to sit on the right hand of the throne of God in heaven and gave us the opportunity today to know him in a personal way and have his death, his burial, and his resurrection, our own, through him. Jesus did this so that we could have life and not go to this place that we mentioned. But if you reject this truth, and remain an unbeliever. According to Revelation 20, verse 15, <clears throat> your name will not be written in the book of life, and you will die unnecessarily in your sins and spend eternity in a place called hell. I know that's not a pleasant thought. Perhaps some of you, this is the first time you've ever heard someone speak as clearly and bluntly as I have. But it's the truth. It's the truth. If you die without Jesus, those words ring in my mind forever and ever and ever. No way. Why not make a decision today on the truth that you've heard? 
You do not have to go to hell. A person does not have to die in that sense. Jesus made a way. In the old days, before modern medicine, when people died, they would talk right up to the end. One such person who had rejected God all of his life, lying in his bed, his hospital bed, died. Suddenly, as though he saw someone else in the room, he reached back and grabbed the rails of the bed in his hospital room and screamed, Don't let him get me. Don't let him take me. Don't you see him? Keep him away. His bloody hand was on the curtain. Keep him away. Hell is before me. I can't see it. Don't let him take me. And according to the book, the last words of saints and sinners, this man slipped off into hell, and he has been there ever since. And he will never, ever, ever, Jesus, when he wrote about this place, said, Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Please don't make this your experience. Get things right before it's too late. Any sane person would say, I'd rather have last week's sermon than this week's sermon. Anyone would rather go to heaven instead of hell. And you don't go to heaven because you're good or because you joined some church. You go to heaven because you trust Jesus Christ as your substitute Savior, doing for you what you could not do yourself and realizing he's the only one that offers to you the opportunity to escape a place like that. Before it's too late, trust him in your own heart. Accept him as your Savior. Perhaps you're here today and you know Christ your Savior, and though this message is not a pleasant one to any of us, you know that you will escape this horrible place because of your reliance upon Jesus Christ. But I would beg you today to think of those who have not heard the truth of what you heard. Family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, be under no false illusion that when you speak to them, they're going to go, oh, I never did that. Yeah, I want to be saved right now. They'll resist you, just like you resist it. But it's the diligent person off of a broken heart that knows the truth, that does not want someone to go to a place like that, that doesn't need to be like the rich men already there saying, please don't sell my brothers. Those of us who know the truth of the gospel now, while they're still alive and while they're still time, we would please go tell the brothers, go tell the family, go tell our co-workers, lest they come to a place like that. May we be a people that reflect the same love of others that Christ has. Whose sacrifice went all the way to the death and the end. May it be said of us that we did not take our opportunity of salvation and hide it under a bushel. But that we shared what we knew about the truth as unpleasant as it may be to us. We pleaded with them to come where there's time so that your name can be written in the book of God. Father, we come before you tonight that today the sadness of that night that is yet ahead of so many. One, I, I just want to thank you that I have not, since I accepted you as my personal Savior, put my head on the pillow at night and feared for my eternal destination should death take me. How I praise your name that my feet are fastened to the rock, Jesus Christ, which cannot move. Grounded, firm, 
and the Savior said, Thank you for the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you for being my Savior, for dying in my place, for experiencing my judgment in my place. Lord, I pray that I would not take the wonderful salvation that you've given me for granted without any consideration for others who may not know or may not understand the impending judgment that will be sent. Help us to be diligent and to tell others. Help us not to be discouraged when, like Lot's children, they look at us like we're half stone. Help us not to be discouraged. Because as sure as in Lot's day, the fire came down and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, the fire will come from God one day and destroy this home and this earth and will cast unbelievers into the lake of fire where they will be tormented for. Lord, I pray that we'd never forget that. And we tell everyone that we know. God is sure. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. We'd love for you to come to know him. In a true way. In a, about five minutes I can show you from the Bible. If you do not know. How you can know him personally. And know that you know that you know him personally. If you're here today and you do know Christ as your Savior, take this next song to heart. Only one life to offer, Jesus my Lord and King. Only one tongue to praise thee of thy mercy, sing. Only one heart's devotion, Savior. Oh, may it be consecrated to thee. Alone to thy natural spirit, yield it fully. Stand with me if you would. Let's sing this song. Perhaps while you're singing, you'd want to make your appeal to the Lord. God, help me not to be indifferent to the law. Help me while there's yet time to tell the story. Lest anyone go to that place. Let's pray together. As we sing. to be yielded to thee. Help us to tell the story. Not all will hear and believe, but by our lips may all hear. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for your generosity. I believe